morning and God bless you all. Good morning. Good morning and good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to, to know that we've got people in Zoom. We've got people in the building. We know that God has done something each in each and every one of our lives. Yes. I'm so happy that during the devotion, people stood up and gave God the due yes. that He rightfully deserves. Yes. Yes. I give all glory and honor to my Father God who lives in heaven. Yes. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, He is. And I acknowledge the Holy Spirit who strengthens, and guides, protects, and inspires me each and every day. Yes. To everyone who can hear my voice, I greet you in peace. I am Reverend Michael Brian Horton. And last week I informed you that God has made a way for you. Yes. I focused on the fact that God has placed open doors in your life. And you cannot find them by yourself. You need to rely on God. You need to humble yourself, and then God will lead you to the open doors in your life. Yes, yes. Today, I still focus on, like last week I told you, this is a series that God has made a way for you. And what I want you to know is that not only has God made a way for you, but He desires for you to be different. He he desires for you to make a difference in people's lives. Yes. And in order to do so, you have to dare to be different. Yes. You didn't hear what I said. Yes. God said you have to dare to be different. Yes. For those who don't believe me, or for those who say, where is the preacher getting this from? I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Amen. One, two, one, two. It felt like I was going to break up for, in a rap for a moment. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Let us, for those who are able, let us stand in honor of God's holy word. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24 says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, somebody say, put off. put off. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed. Somebody say, be renewed. be renewed. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on, somebody say, put on. Put on. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, we thank you for what you've done for each and every one of us this day, O oh God. You woke us up in our right mind and you brought us here, O oh Lord, to praise and worship you. You brought us here, O oh Lord, to hear a word from you. We ask, O oh God, that you prepare our hearts, our mind, our body, and our soul, O oh God, spirit too, so that we might receive the word that you have for us. Lord God, I ask personally that you fill me anew. You give me the power, the unction, and everything that I will need 
to do this task that you set before me. And when you do this, O oh God, I will be ever so careful to give you all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory that you rightfully deserve. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Let God's people say amen. 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 You wonder why Paul wrote this letter. He wrote this letter not to unbelievers. He wrote this letter to those who believe. Amen. He wrote though, this letter to the people, the saints in the church of Ephesus. Why did he write this letter? Can I talk to you for a minute? He wrote this letter to encourage them to think differently. He wrote this letter to encourage them to act differently. He knew that they needed encouragement, so he said, you know what, let me write this letter of encouragement. How many of you know that there's people in your life that you may be prone to just walk on by? You may be prone not to call them day to day, but how many of you know that they need a word of encouragement from you? You don't have to know what's going on in their life. Did you ever wonder why sometimes you're doing something and God puts someone's name on your heart or he puts their face in front of you? That's because God is letting you know. We talked about during the, uh, the devotion, we talked about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is guiding us. The Holy Spirit wants you to know that somebody needs to hear from you. Somebody needs your help, whether you think it or not. Some people don't think that they're that important. But let me tell you, God has a job for you. God sent you by so that you could encourage somebody. So that's what Paul is doing in this letter. He is encouraging the saints known as Ephesians. He challenges them to take on a new identity. He challenged them to dare to be different. Say dare to be different. Dare to be different. And there's four points that he makes in the scripture that we just read. Point one, he said walk differently. Mm. Walk differently. In other words, he wanted them to, instead of walking with a gait that's beaten down because life has gotten the best of them, he said, no, stand up. You are in God. God loves you. God's son died for you. And then on the third day, he was resurrected and he sits on the right hand of power, acting as your intercessor and your mediator. Not only that, him and his father sent you the Holy Spirit to help you in this life. Yes. So I don't care what's happening to you in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying, don't walk like they got the best of you. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying, stand up. Yeah. Walk with your shoulders back. Right. You serve a mighty God. Yeah. You serve the risen Savior. You have the Holy Spirit within you. So walk differently. Yes. Don't walk like those people who don't know God. Mm -hmm. Don't walk like those people that don't have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Don't walk like those people who don't pray to God knowing that God is going to answer their prayers. Mm -hmm. You're better than that. So he's yeah. telling them, walk differently. Mm -hmm. oh my Psalm 1-1. One, one. I love this. I love this psalm. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Paul is saying, you're better than the sinners. You know not to walk, not to do the things you used to do after you gave your life over to Christ. He's saying, don't go back to what you used to be. He's saying, you want to be blessed, you've got to walk right. And he's encouraging them. He says, being a Christian is not about just saying, yes, Jesus, I believe you. Yes, God, I have faith in you. Yes, I have the Holy Spirit in me. Yes, I got up and I went to church. Yes, I gave a testimony. Yes, I gave my tithe. Yes, I, I took communion. He's saying, no. Being a Christian is about changing. Changing what you was yesterday into what God wants you to be tomorrow. You might have the Holy Spirit and you say, well, the Holy Spirit will do the job for me. Let me tell you something. If you don't want it, God is not going to do it for you. If you don't want to help God do it, God is not going to do it alone. God didn't serve this thing on a Christian plaque. You've got to sweat. Yes, You've got to set some tears. Yes, sir. You, mm, let me tell you, 
You've got to put some energy into this Christian walk. How do you think you're going to move from what you was yesterday into tomorrow? It requires change on your part. He tells them to walk differently. Not only did he tell them to walk differently, he's telling them you've got to change the avenues in which you walk. If I was, I was born and raised on Shakespeare Avenue in the South Bronx. God does not want me to continue to walk up and down Shakespeare Avenue. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten to where God wanted me to get to. At some point, God desired for me to leave my home. He desired for me to leave the things I was familiar with. He desired for me to step out on faith. And God, in stepping out on faith, he showed me another road that he wanted me to travel. Paul is telling them, you've got to change the avenues and the highways and the byways that you're walking on because those highways and byways have been filled with sin. Those highways and byways almost cause you to die. If it wasn't for God, and his love for you. He took you up out of those byways and those highways and he set you on a new path. If it wasn't for God, you would be sin in the gutter in which you was and you would die in your sin and go to hell. Paul is saying you've got to change the avenues in which you walk. That's why in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 15 it says enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. How many of you know that most people in this day and age are on the broad way that leads to destruction? Only a select few. Are, have entered the gate and are traveling and staying on the narrow way that leads to life and life more abundantly. Church, we have to change the avenues, the highways, and the byways. We have to forsake. Let me tell you, in this change that God desires in us, we have to forsake the things that we, our natural person wants to do. Let me tell you, your natural instinct is to do wrong. Your natural instinct is not to do right. That's why God put his spirit in you. It is his spirit that moves you to do the things of God. It is your spirit to honor the words that are of God. It is the spirit that causes you to obey the commandments of God. By your own strength, you would never do it. And you would die and go to hell. And on judgment day, you would be awoken. And you would be judged. And then you would be thrown into the lake of fire. We can't do this thing by ourselves. But God desires for us to change. As far as changing, how many of you are familiar with changing your clothes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. On a hot day in the summertime, mm -hmm. you shower, yes. you put on a, 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 a change, you put on some clothes, mm -hmm. and then you go about your business. If you go on to work, but if on a hot day before you even get to the train station or before you get to your car, you are sweating and you're like, oh man, I need to go back in and take another shower. Uh -huh. Have you ever been in a day where it's that hot? Yes, Before you even move forward, you just are sweating. You say, I gotta go back home uh -huh. and change. And then what you do, you change it, you take your clothes off. In verse 22, Paul tells them, put off. No. Notice he didn't say God is gonna take you. Come here. Like, how many of you ever had children? Uh -huh. And you have the little babies. And you tell the little one, take your clothes off. And they're like, Daddy, help me. Mommy, help me. Uh -huh. like, and their children are so funny. They go to take off their shirt, and somehow the shirt is all twisted. It's like a maze. And you wonder how did they get like that. <laughs> they need your help. But let me tell you, God is not going to take it off for you. God will deliver you when you get in some, in some problems. And you ask for his help, because that's the kind of God that he is. But there's some things.
things that God requires you to use your energy to take off. And so Paul says, you've got to take off. And what does he tell them? You've got to take off. You've got to take off your old man. Now I'm not taking, I'm not, some of the things I'm going to say may not be applicable to Antioch Christian Global Church. I'm talking to the church in general. If all of the church in the world, you know that there's only one church, right? There may be many instances of the church. There may be the, the church at 28 Oliver. There may be the church at this location, but you do realize there's only one body and there's only one head, and that head is Christ. So if the shoe fits, where's what I'm getting ready to say? Say so. What God wants you to do is to take off your bad attitude. That's right. Say so. God wants you to take off that attitude of lacking gratefulness. God has done some things for you, church. And you're not showing God that you are grateful. And then you expect God to continue to bless you. Parents know that if you give something beyond what children need, if you give them that something and they don't show an attitude of gratefulness, you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to do that again. Let me tell you, God is looking at some people in the church. And he is saying, well, I'm not going to do that again. Mm. Because they have the wrong attitude. Right. Some people have this attitude that just because they've been saved, they can go out and cause the grace of God to be executed over and over and over again. Because they want to live in sin. God is saying, you know what? I'm going to get to a certain point where I'm not going to keep forgiving you of your sins because you are showing me through this attitude that you have, that you are not truly repenting of your sin. So guess what? I'm going to hold you accountable for your sins. And let me tell you, for every action, there is a reaction. Amen. My mother told me, you can do something, things, some things, but there's a consequence. And let me tell you, grace and mercy is when you do a sin. Yes. And you ask God for forgiveness. Yes. And God does not let the true consequences yes. of that sin yes. fall upon your head. Yes. Yes. So Paul is telling them, you've got to put off the attitude that you're wearing. Yes. The attitude that you know better than God. Yes. The attitude that you know which way you should live your life. And you know what's best for you. Yes. Mm. You should give up this attitude of being a person who's a thorn in the side of the church. Because you can't listen to the pastor. You can't listen to the words of the preachers. You can't work with the deacons and the trustees. You can't work on a committee formed out of the people in the pews to advance the church. God is saying you've got to put that attitude off. That's what Paul is saying to them. Do you not know that People call members of the body of Christ hypocrites because we don't live what the way that we know we are supposed to live. So why would they want to come in and be part of the body of Christ when it's filled with hypocrites? They say to themselves, I might as well stay outside in the world and have a good time than go into a church and deal with hypocrites. They say, you know what? Too many people in the church have this attitude where they don't show love all the time. God sends people to the church and sometimes we don't show love as much as we should. We talk about people. You know one of the, the worst things to advance and to move in to where God wants us to move so that he can bless us is all of the talking that goes on in the background when everyone said we were going to go move forward. And let me tell you, all of that talking that's going on in the background is like an anchor that holds us in the same place. And God will not allow us to move out of this same place until we take care of all that stuff. How are we going to move forward? How is the body of Christ, the one church, going to move forward 
when we're hurting each other. Mm -hmm. right. A statement, a phrase like church hurt should not exist. Mm -hmm. It should not exist in the vocabulary of the church, not when it comes to God's church. Right. Church hurt causes people to leave the church. Yes. And right. Church hurt causes people not to want to join the church. Right. And let me tell you, where God wants us to go, we need spiritual gifts. Yeah. And those spiritual gifts are not always possessed by the people in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, 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 need a, you need an example? I'm looking at this piano. And I don't see a piano play. Mm. Okay. I'm looking at the pews. I'm looking at the, the choir stand. And I'm looking at the, the microphones that should hold, hold the, 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 the stands that should hold the microphone. And behind that microphone should be singers. Where they at? They coming. Let me tell you, they are coming. I feel, I feel it in my own fire. That God has blessings in store for this church. And the people are coming. But we can't stay here. We've got to resolve this stuff. So we can move forward. And then God will send us what we need. In order to move forward, we can't stand here. What does that mean? We've got to change. There's some customs that we are used to. There's some way of life in the church that we are used to. Then we have to say, you know what? They served mommy and dad. They brought in a lot of saints. They accomplished what God wanted to be accomplished at that time. But God has a new thing that he wants to accomplish. And it requires for us to say, Hustle, I've got to leave you now. Doesn't mean I'm leaving my Bible. I'm taking my Bible with me. But I've got to leave the custom alone. And I've got to step out into the new world. I've got to bring the children in. The children mean change. They are showing us that change is required. And to any church on the face of this earth. If you are not adopting the change that the children desire, you will cease to exist. When the last member of the church dies out. All right, all right. So we've got to change. Yes. All right. So put off is what God said. Put off is what Paul said. And then he said you got to be renewed. renewed. It's not enough just to put it off. Yes, you've got to be renewed. In my analogy of a hot summer day, you've got to take a shower. Uh -huh. You've got to wash that sweat off. Uh -huh. God is saying you've got to be renewed by the washing of your spirit in the word of God, not on Sunday, not on Monday, but from Sunday to Sunday, you've got to make time to wash your spirit, wash your body in the word of God by picking up your Bible. You don't know what to read? When you have your Bible, say, God, Holy Spirit. I'm going to open this Bible, and when I open it, I want it to open to what you want me to read Amen. and what you want me to study. If you say that to God, He will do it. You've got to wash in the Word, because the washing in the Word changes the way you think. You're not going to change the way you think. That's a God responsibility. You just have to subject yourself to saying, God, I need your help. God, change me. God, I want to change. God, I'm sorry. God, I sinned yesterday, but I'm not going to lay down in my sin. I know that you told me that I will be forgiven, given, so I'm going to get up off the floor, yes. and I'm going to move forward. Yes. You've got to be renewed. And then after that, you've got to put on. There's some things in the Bible that we are supposed to put on every day. In the book of Ephesians, we know that the armor of God, we're supposed to put on every day. But there's something else that we're supposed to put on. We're supposed to put on the new man. The new woman. Yes. Because this is what God has created. And when you put on the new man and the new woman, let me tell you. They are filled with righteousness. And they are filled with holiness. And you need both if you're going to fellowship with God. 
As I wrap up, I want to let you know that God didn't wake you up this morning for you to do the same old thing. God didn't wake you up today to do what you did yesterday. He woke up for you to do something different. And God woke you up. When God woke you up, think of it this way. God woke you up. And by the action of waking you up, he said, my child, dare to be different today. Mm. Wow. 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 Oh, you didn't catch that. Wow. When God woke you up, when your eyes opened and you knew your name, mm. and you knew that God had saved you, mm. you knew God had delivered you in the evening when all kind of things could have happened to you, yes. and God said, dare to be different. Yes. Yes. God opened up this church, the doors of this church for a reason. Dare to be different. Do you know that the people who are in, around, in these buildings around us, you may not see them, but they know you're here. Mm -hmm. You might not have seen the curtain move, but they saw your car drive up. They saw you walk up the steps mm -hmm. to the church. Mm -hmm. And they are saying, and God is saying, dare to be different. They're saying to you, what about us? We see you come together to fellowship in our neighborhood yeah. together, but when are you going to come fellowship with me? I'm waiting on you. Yeah. When are you going to come and help me out? I'm waiting on you. Uh -huh. I know that you're blessed and I see your mighty fine cars. I see the way that you dress. God has blessed you. Uh -huh. And I'm not feeling blessed right now. So when are you going to come and rub elbows with me? So some of what you have rubs off with me. They're waiting for you. People in your neighborhood, they're waiting on you. They knew this Sunday you was going to get up somewhere between the 10, the 9 and the 10 o'clock hour. And you was going to go in your, you know, whether it's a Cessari, whether it's your car, whether it's a friend. They knew you were going to leave. And they know when you're going to return. And they're looking out for your house. They're looking out for your apartment because you're their neighbor. They might not have given their life over, but they're acting neighborly. Yeah. Some people in your neighborhood are saying, when are you going to come fellowship with me? Amen. I have need, I need to know what makes you radiate joy. Mm. What's that, that light that I see on you that I, when I look in the mirror, I don't see on myself? Uh -huh. They're waiting on you. They're saying, when are you going to make a difference? Mm. When are you going to dare to be, make, when are you going to dare to be different in your own neighborhood? Mm. Wow. Some of your family members that you can't stand mm -hmm. because they are the, like when you compare them to your Christian walk. The mm -hmm. Bible says don't judge, but when you do judge, because we are natural beings, Amen. and if you really admit, you do judge. Amen. You judge yourself when you looked in the mirror. Amen. You judge the person as soon as you saw. You said, "Oh, that looks nice." You judge them because it could have looked bad, or you said that looks bad. You judge them because it could have looked good. So you, in the natural, you judge. Those people in your family that you've judged, yeah. that you think that um, you're better than them, mm. <laughs> that you're special, mm. <laughs> you're more special, they all special because God created them. God created all of them, so they're all special. But they, because you think you're more special, yeah. God is saying dare to be different. And reach out to that person. Mm. And you never know. Because Christ is seated at the right hand of power. Yes. It's your responsibility to be Christ's representative and show them the love that might change their life and cause them to dare to be different and step out of their situation and come to God and enjoy the blessings that come with fellowship with God. Amen.